Lee Middleditch, and I'm curious as to what each of you think that the government's role should be in this evolution. It's interesting. Um, if, if you heard Senator Warner and you heard me, you heard both of us talk about government playing a role as an enabler, as structuring the incentives. I think you didn't really hear either of us kind of saying the government needs to just step in and just do all this. Um, he said, and I agree, that a lot of the private sector behavior that is dysfunctional is actually induced by perverse incentives that weren't put together with these problems in mind at all, like in the tax code that he was referring to and the way companies invest. That's a terrific agenda to pursue, for example. Or another example might be, um, if, if we're too credentials-based and not enough skills-based, how does government make that problem worse? I'll give you an example of that. Uh, suppose you wanted to take a course from General Assembly in software development. Um, you can't get a federal student loan for that because the whole federal student loan program is geared to the accreditation system. The accreditation system actually is geared to reinforcing the status quo of how credentials are awarded and, not, and actually discourages innovation in moving to a more skills-based fluid system that encourages lifelong learning. So, I mean, these are just small examples. Like, suppose you're a student at, at uh, Young Middle Ditch wants to take, I want to take this class from this school, this class from this online program, and this other thing, and I want to patch this together to give me this skill. Federal student loan program doesn't know how to deal with any of that. These are, in other words, these are government policies that are hindering innovation or disincentivizing innovation. These are just illustrations of where government can play a role. At the state and local level, like if you look at Mississippi or Spartanburg, South Carolina, or Duluth, Minnesota, what you'll see is government saying, all you aerospace folks, can I set aside some land where you can do product testing and set up a lab for which, frankly, 15 different companies in my area can use and that kind of becomes a public good for me to build up an aerospace innovation cluster? Can I support this community college here in northeast Mississippi to teach advanced manufacturing skills and transform my workforce so that I can score this contract to build helicopters for Airbus? True story. Um, thousands of new jobs created in the golden, now, what's now called the Golden Triangle of Mississippi. People didn't think of it as a Golden Triangle 20 years ago, believe me. Um, these are all examples of constructive things governments can and are doing, but Americans don't hear much about them. And Lee, what I, I would say, one, it's great to see you, and two, you know, government will be that social insurance of last resort. I'm not or Philip and I may, I'm not sure we fully disagree on this, but I think we definitely need the social insurance. I'm just saying it may not be fully run by the government the way it has in the past. It may be carried with you in a portable benefit that you have on your, your iPhone that you can you know, pull up at any moment and check. It may be, I think there needs to be a joint contribution from the platform or the employer and the individual but that unemployment or that workman's comp may be reimagined and it may be individualized. And this isn't totally a new idea. Right. For a long time, there was something called the Hour Bank. If you were a union carpenter and you worked for 10, 10 different firms, you didn't have your social benefits managed by the government. You had it managed by a third party entity, the, the labor union. Maybe you re envisioned third party entities helping you with these benefits. I don't want to live in America where everyone, 70% of the workforce, is what we would simply call this binary choice of independent contractor or employee, independent contractors, that's just a free rider problem. When the, when the bad stuff happens, they all it falls back upon the government supported programs. That's not what we want. So getting having some experimentation in communities so we don't simply, even if we make portable benefits, reimpose it in a 20th century construct is one piece. The second piece is I do think there are things, I mean, you know, the capitalism that existed for most of the 20th century was, did value more long-term value creation. It was really only when technology in a way created the flow of capital that was so quickly, and then we rewarded an incentive system that rewarded based only on quarterly based returns. So we have pension funds all across America that are long-term value creators and 401ks that should have a long-term perspective, but the money managers who manage them are rewarded on a quarterly basis. Aligning compensation with long-term returns 
government does have some role there, recognizing that we have so overbalanced capital over labor in our tax code, rebalancing a, lot, a little bit so human capital has some of the same tax advantages and not just high end. You know, this is a, this is a, a fundamental rethinking, you know, and there are ways that can play out. You know, and, and these are not things I've talked with Philip about. These are not things probably ready for prime time. But you know, the notional idea of, of greater voting power going with longer held shares. The idea of different compensation metrics for, for money managers based upon longer term value creation. Even potentially optional corporate forms that might reward investment in lower skilled workers with higher, higher skills. Candidly, government if they, or business that they can train up people oftentimes do it better than government. But we've disincented that in so much of our work. There are ways to think through this, but it's gonna take, you know, I'm not sure where it falls on the liberal conservative continuum. And that's actually Good. an opportunity. I'm afraid you, you two guys are too smart for the America we live in, uh, but, but I, I hope not. Um, but, no, but just I, I don't think so. I think that what has happened is. We're dumbing down. A hundred years ago, People were, it's not like people were dumb 100 years ago. People had serious conversations that were just as complicated at, at, for that era. Um, but, you know, people can ha uh, there are a lot of people who can handle stuff, but you have to open up the conversation and kind of have more senators like Senator yeah, Warner. Well, but you also need thinkers, and there are people, let me give him the equal plug on, the, on, on his book. Uh, you know, there's great work in this book with tangible examples. The good news is there are a lot I can only speak to the Senate, I can't speak to the House. There are a lot more senators of goodwill from both parties who desperately want a way out of this zero-sum game that is masquerading as the American political debate right now. By the way, and I, I, the idea of taking some of these ideas and advancing ideas before they get captured as a Democrat or Republican idea, man, oh man, what an opportunity. And one of the cool things about this book, and let's do take another question um, uh, that I didn't get a chance to say before, is that among the list of the contributors to this whole project that Philip's a part of, uh, it's really quite a remarkable spectrum of business leaders, public officials, uh, other kinds of thought leaders, Democrats, Republicans, I mean, really a wide range of folks. Um, Let me put a plug in for the, the Aspen Project. We've raised money from a series of foundations, all the brand name foundations, from a series of businesses. I've got Mitch Daniels, we've got uh, uh, two very well established policy leaders. One fellow, Bruce Reed, who'd worked for, for President Clinton, was Biden's um, chief of staff and head of, uh, of uh, uh, the Simpson Bowles Commission. John Bridgeland, who worked for Rob Portman, was uh, Bush 43's economic policy, uh, policy advisor, has been very, we've kind of balanced Democratic and Republican policymakers. There is a chance, you know, making capitalism work in the 21st century and recreating a social contract, those are big notional ideas. But when we turn on the debates and the food fight that goes on, I think there'd be a lot more appetite for that than, and, and those of us who think the American public's not ready for it, doesn't realize the American public that I get a chance to inter interface with every day. They're yearning for something that elevates the debate. I'm certainly willing to accept you guys as world authorities on this. Are other countries experimenting with the same kind of thinking? Yes, I mean, so. Germany, you know, Germany has had a different kind of social contract for the second half of the 20th century. You know, Finland is actually experimenting with something that would seem very radical at this point, but actually has been embraced, I'm not there at this point, but is in, in being embraced by economists of the, both the left and the right of a guaranteed minimum income. There are models in a variety of, I'm not sure those are the right models, but the idea that we're simply gonna reimpose the 20th century binary choice on a workplace that's gonna be dramatically different. And Lee, this is not just gonna be the drivers and the delivers. This is, this is transforming the, the legal industry right now. This gig economy, this, this per, you know, per task work. And there are good things, but there are some very scary things if we don't get it right. Uh, Britain also, and this is a, a conservative, the conservative Cameron government is doing some really if, see, if people could, this is just nascent now. This is just beginning, this conversation is just beginning to take off. It's looking for oxygen. Because um, actually, I think if you really got this conversation going, you'd find it would very quickly become a transatlantic conversation where people would start noticing a lot of different models. 
because a lot of people, often at lower levels that people aren't hearing about, are conducting these experiments that are potentially really exciting. Let me give you just two last examples, then I'll get out of here because I've got to go do other, my day job. Um, but you know, there are a whole series of businesses that understand that the current kind of short-termism capitalism is not working. And there are efforts from the B Corp movement, the Benefit Corp movements in 31 states that tries to, like, good housekeeping seal of approval uh, around better corporate responsibility. Paul Tudor Jones, somebody who's made major investments in, in the community, has got a new entity called Just Capital that's around ranking corporate behavior. There's Mike Bloomberg has got a whole effort around sustainability indexes. The whole notion of where I've been focusing my efforts is on pay and training, particularly for low and moderate skilled income workers, because if you can somehow make them less reliant upon you know, government programs and more successful within the capitalism system, what's not the like? But that's going to change, and there is a leaning in of a lot of, of, of corporations that just maybe need a little bit of tweaking on, on the uh, incentive side. On the gig side, you know, you know you're in the right spot, as Philip has said, we're at the nascent stage of this, when depending on the crowd, this is called the gig economy, the on-demand economy, or the sharing economy, when you don't even have the name of what's going on, you know you're an early stage investor. <laughs> but I can give you, uh, just we, um, Time Magazine just finished a 3,000 person online survey. So it was online, it was during December. And the numbers seemed a little high even, even for me, but it said 44% of Americans have accessed an on-demand service. 22% over the last two years have offered an on-demand service. 7% derive much of their income from it. Now even if those numbers are high, they're high for December, they won't be high for July. This is sweeping through the workplace. And it can either have a great positive effect on people's lives. The number of people I sat with in Charlottesville at one of these shared working spaces, and they weren't just millennials. Many of them were people who had been disrupted by the, the recession, who were saying, my gosh, having control over my own life again is a lot that I, I don't think as a policymaker I fully appreciate it. But having control without some level of social insurance, we're just creating another cliff. I think we have to stop there. A reminder, I think the books are available in the ante room, and I'm guessing Philip Zellico would be willing to sign them. Uh, but thank you guys both very much. It was really fascinating. Oh, thank you. Much.